So before we get going, let's remind ourselves, art isn't necessarily the best gauge of reality. Yes, we've already deconstructed this a bit, but it's worth bringing up. Because we're about to use art informed by texts to try to figure out how exactly Hoplites fought with a spear and shield. We're going to look at two different schools of thought on the matter. The first is the old school method, and this is the method that's reflected by Sage in your source book, your textbook. The written product you're going to produce from today's exercise is a discussion of uh, Sage's description of hoplite warfare based on data that we collect doing this in the field. So it's basically going to be a write-up of what we do today. So I'm going to talk you through the old school, how we used to think this worked, and then I'm going to introduce you to a newer argument introduced by Christopher Matthew, who is an Australian scholar who works in experimental archaeology, which is what we're going to be doing today. So experimental archaeology is using reproduction material items, in this case spears and shields, to address, answer, and explore questions about how things were done in the past. So let's start with the old school. Looking at Greek art, when we see spears being wielded, or at least spear-like items, long sticks being used for warfare activities, the most common way that they're held is this way. Like uh, Hector on the far left-hand side is holding his maybe spear, maybe javelin. More about that later. So at this point, I invite you to take your spear, both you and the people at home. Okay, so hold it so that your thumb is facing upwards near the back end. All right, so then you're going to hold it up so that your thumb is facing towards your face and the business end, the pointy end of your spear is the side that your pinky finger is on. Have it like that? So the pointy end of your spear is going to be the same end that your pinky is gripping, and your thumb is going to be pointed away from the pointy end. Okay. Now very carefully, not actually stabbing anybody, try to stab. How's that feel? Um, it's kind of awkward. Like, does your wrist hurt? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, that, it feels weird, doesn't it? Okay, like, where, if... If you were standing, say, kind of imagine you're standing and trying to stab somebody like this, what would you be stabbing? Like their face? Maybe their neck? A bird. But you're, a bird. You're kind of like down at this weird angle. <laughs> like your upper arm gets really tired really fast. Or maybe that's just my upper arm. I'm really out of shape. It's been a long pandemic. Okay. So that is the high grip, though, and this is the most common grip that we see represented in ancient art, which is why we used to think this is the primary attack, like this, this is how you do most of your attacking, which reenactors noticed early and often was really awkward, and reenactors would train and train and train to try to figure out how to reliably stab people like this, and it took a lot of effort and was kind of confusing. Okay, so the second grip, we're going to do this a little different. So return your spear down to kind of like straight up in front of you like you're holding a broom handle or something. Okay. So this time, you're going to hold it with your thumb down. Yeah, so your thumb's down. And then you're going to hold it like Achilles is doing in this art. So Achilles is on the right, the, the naked dude that doesn't have a thigh wound. So you're going to pick it up and you're going to hold it down with your thumb forward. Yeah, like that. Okay, now without actually stabbing anyone, try to stab like this. A little better, huh? Yeah. Now, we see people using this grip a lot too. So the theory was that when you were fighting as a hoplite, you would be switching back and forth between this high position and this low position. So 
be careful not to hit anybody. I want you to try to switch. So you've got your low grip, yeah? Switch back to the high grip. So I notice a lot of you doing a little toss like that. And that's what we used to like, think people did. So try doing that a couple of times. Like you can stand up if you need to. Standing up kind of helps with this a little bit. So you're fighting, 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 fighting. Oh, I need to stab down because this is super awkward. Switch to low. Okay, now switch to high. Oh, gotta switch again. A little awkward, yes? Okay. So, to get around this, there were some theories that maybe you don't toss. Maybe instead what you do is you use your lizarder. So say you're high, stabby, stabby, stabby. What you do is you kind of go back like you're doing the limbo or something. You, you put your lizarder in the ground, and then you switch, and then you come back around like that, which is every bit as awkward as it sounds. Um, if, if especially if you're someone who brought like a literal stick. <laughs> it's just, it, this is super awkward, yes? This is how Sage is going to tell you to fight. Experimental archaeologists began to question this uh, for reasons of awkwardness. And historians were like, no, 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 this is what we see in the art. And this is how we do it, because that's what's in the art. And the art is always right, except for when people are naked, that's wrong. Uh-huh. So here's an example of a modern history of warfare textbook showing you how to do these two spear grips. You'll notice they're not showing you how to switch. They're just showing the two spear grips as if like this is super doable in the heat of battle. And here's a close-up of the low, and this will be more useful for those of you playing at home, which is not y'all, but I'm recording this. And here's the high. So practice that a little bit, see how it works out for you. You can do that at home, too. Oh, fancy. So now we're going to move on to the new school spear drill. So this is a solution proposed by ancient warfare historian and classical scholar Chris Matthew, who is also an experimental archaeologist. He works with hoplite reenacting communities. And these are folks who have gone as close as you can get to hoplite warfare in the modern world without actually stabbing people. I have the book here for those of y'all who want to look at it. And I've also put the Amazon link on this slide. It's three bucks on Kindle. So if you're really interested, it's super duper cheap and it's a quite good read. Uh, Chris is also just a really fun person. We got in trouble in a hotel bar once for sword fighting. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're not supposed to sword fight in the hotel bar. Uh, we were trying to figure out this uh, passage from the Livy's Macedonian Wars. It doesn't matter, but at any rate, he's, he's cool, though. So buy his book if you have three bucks. Now, he first began to pick away at this problem by asking, so this overhand grip, right, this thumb towards the back, hand up like this, this thing, is that a thrusting maneuver or is this something else? Are we, in fact, looking at a javelin throw? So let's talk about javelins. A javelin, as I've said before, is a throwing spear. And it's structurally very similar to a thrusting spear, especially in art. It's really hard to tell the difference because they're both sticks with points on the end. And sticks with points on the end, well, I mean, we've got the largest variety of sticks with points on the end here today, and they still kind of all look the same, yes? So if you're, say, painting on a small ceramic pot, you stick with a point on the end, it may be very difficult to tell whether it's a javelin or a thrusting spear. And this is constrained also by the amount of 
space available to a pottery artist because often there isn't a lot of clearance on one side of the subject or another. And if you want to get multiple people into a scene, say if you want to show the fight between Hector and Achilles at the end of the Iliad, then you need to kind of smush them unrealistically close together, even if they've got javelins, which are a ranged weapon. It's about a mid-ranged weapon. But javelins are a little lighter than a thrusting spear, and they don't have the heavy lizard on the back end. So the butt is lighter, and the center of balance is at the center. For a thrusting spear, the center of balance is like here, and then the lizarder counterweights it. But for a javelin here, the other thing that makes a javelin visibly different is subtle, and that is the javelin strap. And this is an illustration of what a javelin strap is. So this is a long thong that's doubled up, like uh, you can do this with a shoelace if you want to. You wrap it around in a spiral down the javelin. You have your fingers around it so that when you throw the javelin, it will unwrap, causing your javelin to rifle. It's the same reason why the inside of a rifle has spiraling cuts in the barrel. This makes the bullet rotate, and rotation in a projectile causes it to fly straighter and farther. It's the same reason why arrow fletching is often spiraled a little bit. It makes the arrow spiral when it's on the wing. Similarly then, this strap on the javelin is an important part of making a javelin throw accurate, hard, and long-ranged. But it's kind of hard to see it in art. So this is one of the easier ones to spot. So this fellow has a javelin that's kind of like half unrolled. You can see the thong kind of midway down it. Uh, but it's still pretty subtle, and it's kind of rubbed off a little bit because it's done in a different kind of glaze. And this is the best case scenario. This is such a subtle detail, often the artist will leave it off because it just looks a little messy. But you can still sometimes see it when you look at pottery, but not always. The other thing you can look for is the finger position. One thing about the javelin throwing finger position, your thumb is in the back, not the front because your two fingers are holding the thong and you're throwing it not in your hand to thrust, but I'll do this across the front of the room and I'm not good at throwing, so you guys are safe. So here we go. That, that is very bad, but you can see it. Oh, you're all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it left my hand up and out my two fingers followed it, but here the flipping motion of my hand was a feature, not a bug. So what we might be seeing in all these overhand grips is a javelin throw. Why so many javelin throws? First, the same reason why everybody's naked. It looks cool. This looks heroic. You can see pecs for days, like you, you can see everything because the person is splayed out and then you can get a full frontal view of their heroic nudity, and we can all admire our pretty pot with our heroically nude dudes on it. And this is a thing ancient Greeks love in their art, as we've previously established. It also makes for a really dynamic action shot, like this kind of a pose. It's menacing, it's big, and it takes up a lot of nice horizontal space, which is good on art as opposed to like that, uh, where you're underhand stabbing, that's it's not as fancy. Your arm's kind of at a funky angle. Whereas you know, this, I speak line, it's very ballet. So let's have a look at these bits of art and see what we can see. So the top one, this fellow on, um, in the, the roundel, javelin or spear, do you think? Yeah? Okay, why? Um, I noticed that there's a little bit of a string there. Yeah, there's kind of a strappy thing, and he's using his pinkies, which is weird. But yeah. <laughs> also, it's more towards the front. Yeah. 
on photo not exactly the center, but it's yeah. definitely not for the back. Yeah. yeah. So the hand position, the weight, kind of a strappy thing. Yeah. Folks concur pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They did. Uh, we'll look at a few pictures of what that looked like in a minute. In the new spear drill, the javelin throw is the first part of engagement. So before your line meets the other line, you throw your javelin, take out your thrusting spear, and then by the time you come together, you've got your thrusting spear out. So you're going to be carrying a couple of javelins and then have your doru back up. Okay. Or you might even be carrying it like this and then, but probably more like that, back to back. Okay, so second piece of art, this one at the bottom where our weirdly clothed epic hero is dying and everybody else is naked and winning. Uh, javelins or spears, do you think? What looks javelin-y? Yep. The grip, the grip, yeah. So it's like center of the thing, so javelin-y. What else looks javelin-y? Yeah, it, it's being held at the middle, you know, the center of the balance looks here, um, you know, thumbs back. In this model, that's javelin-y. Now, what doesn't look javelin-y? Yeah? The different, Yeah, like, this is a really silly time to be throwing a javelin. Like, somebody's already dead, what the heck? Like, the timeline is off. What else doesn't look javelin-y? Uh-huh. Yeah, like it, the formation is weird. It's, it, that also suggests we're too late in the timeline for javelins. Yeah? I don't know what this one looks like, but the um, kick doesn't look like what the kick is for a javelin. Yeah, these are very large tips for javelins. Uh, javelins, we expect a, a smaller, more bodkin-y tip. These are quite big. I mean, that one is, the one on the top is also pretty big. But even so, it's, it's a little much. Where's the strap? Exactly. <laughs> and this is the problem facing us, is that art is often very ambiguous about what we're looking at. You can usually find some data that suggests javelins, some that suggests spears, but it's kind of hard to tell. And this comes back to the because it's art and it's trying to look cool, not necessarily trying to tell us how warfare works. People weren't using pottery as warfare how-to diagrams. You know, it wasn't like you went to boot camp and somebody would take out a pot and be like, okay, men, here's your pot training for the day. You're going to be doing, uh, that's not what it was for. That's not what people were trying to do. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no contact with reality. They are showing shield types and spear types and tactics that would make sense to the culture at the time because you draw from what you know, much like we do, right? Our own art of warfare is a mixture between what warfare actually looks like and what we think looks cool. So this isn't just them. We do it too. All right. So let's go back to the Shiji base for a minute. You remember the Shiji base, yes? This is that uh, oldest depiction of probably, almost definitely, hoplite phalanx all together in action doing their hoplite thing. At the back ends of the formation, there are a few soldiers who are still putting on their gear. You can see the fellow strapping on his greaves, the guy putting on his helmet. I've seen a meme version of this where it's a zooming in on the helmet putting on guy's face, and it says, <laughs> when you're about to go into battle and you realize you left your oven on. <laughs> it's a bit of a mood. <laughs> He's looking a little freaked out there, and I don't blame him. 
Behind them, though, and in front of them, you can see pairs of javelins that are stuck into the ground with their straps attached, ready to go. So even in the Shiji base, we do see javelins as part of the formation. And then the folks running into battle seem to have their thrusting spears out, although the guy on the end, it, it's shorter, it's lighter, maybe he's still got a javelin. Okay. So now we're getting into Matthew's new spear drill. So old school spear drill was the thumb back, thumb down, toss your spear, awkward thing. New school works like this. First thing you do is you throw your javelin. We don't have javelins, we're not gonna do that, it's dangerous. But as you are closing, you throw your javelins, you take out your thrusting spear and you have it carried like this over your shoulder. So for the, for the audio file, I'm starting, actually, let's all do this. All right. Up you go. Okay. So I'm standing, I'm holding this like a wizard staff out in front of me. My thumb is up, grabbing it near the butt end. My point is down on the ground in front of me. Thumb back. And my carrying position, I just pick it up and put it on my um, not shield shoulder. So on me, that's my right shoulder. My shield's on my left arm, if I have my shield. Like this, and then trot off into battle, there you go, there's your carrying position. And that's how you start. Okay. And here's the carrying position demonstrated on a base. Like so. So what comes next is based on a kill shot not aimed at the neck. Uh, the archeological evidence just doesn't support the neck as the preferred kill shot zone for a couple of reasons. First, it's pretty well protected by the Corinthian helmet's profile. It's behind both a shield and a helmet. It's a hard area to aim for, especially if your hand is backwards. And when we find thorax haze, these breastplates from antiquity, there isn't a lot of damage around the neck area, so there's not evidence that people tried to stab in the neck much. What we do find when we find damage on chest armor is damage to the thorax, to the mid-belly region. And that makes sense, because if you want to stab somebody fatally in the heart, the best way to do it, please don't do this, like, unless you really have to, but please don't murder people. And if you murder people, don't thank me later. Um, what you want to do, and here I'm taking my spear out of the carry position. My thumb is forward. It's kind of tucked a little bit under my arm. And I'm aiming the tip of my spear right underneath the bottom left-hand side of the other person's rib cage. So, uh, right up in here. And you want to do that because there's a lot of tough cartilage and bone if you go through the rib cage proper. So you want to get in underneath, stab through the diaphragm and up into the heart area. And even if you don't get the heart exactly, you'll probably get like the vena cava or the aorta or both, or you know, at the very least a cardiac tamponade, which is good as. And if not that, you punctured a lung. So. Yeah, you're, you're going to really inconvenience whoever you just bombed. Also, if you're going up against somebody in a linothorax, you can, like this base painting person is doing, go in through the splits that are cut into the armor to accommodate the hips. So you can kind of get in underneath the edge of the armor, up through the rib cage into the thorax. And if you miss, you can go for the groin which is a nice secondary target. So that's what we're aiming at, is we're aiming low. We're trying to get under the other person's shield or around the side of the other person's shield, not over the top and down like we used to think. So keeping all that in mind, go back to your carry position. So thumb up, spear on your shoulder. Um, actually, I think I started you in the wrong position. So like the, the point should be up when you do this. Points up, thumb up, onto your shoulder. This is the low grip with an upward thrust. 
So kind of grip towards your lizard or thumb up. You're going to lower your spear. It's going to be about at the level of your hip, like Priscilla is doing. And you're going to go step forward, thrust up. So don't be afraid to get down low. You want to keep your center of gravity low. Down and up. And back. Down and up. And back. Down and up. And back. And you want to keep doing that for a while. It's a nice, efficient movement. You're putting your hip into it. You're getting some good torque. And your shield stays in place. If you do this in sync with your entire line, all of you doing this together, you can poke at your enemy pretty efficiently. Okay, so that's your low grip. But you may notice that your arm's kind of getting a little tired here. It's a little awkward, a bit strain on the elbow. So, there's the underarm grip. This is the workhorse grip. This does not look pretty. What I'm doing, I'm just going from a low grip and I'm bending my elbow and rolling the spear. So I'm tucking it up like this fellow is. I'm kind of keeping my hand up, just like this guy is. So my, my wrist is a little bendy, tucked up under, my shield's out. And this, you're going to stab directly forward. Head back. Be careful. You might, like, bonk yourself at the chest if you not careful with the butt end of your spear, so kind of watch it, but your spear is going to twist a little bit on that forward thrust. That's a feature, not a bug. So as you're snapping into your opponent, you're twisting the blade and back and twist and back. And this is a nice, efficient use of your arm strength. You can do this quite a while, repeatedly. This isn't represented a lot in art. We think not because this wasn't a common way of stabbing people. But instead, he looks awkward. <laughs> it's a funky wrist position. It, it, this does not look as heroic as that. <laughs> but we think this is the bread and butter of your stabby stabby when you're in a hoplite phalanx. Nice, efficient. Snap. Now, sometimes you do want to go high, and that brings us to the high grip. So for the high grip, go from your underarm, untuck, and bring it up. So this is almost exactly like the old school high grip, but your thumb is forward, not back. And for this, this is kind of an up and down, but you're stabbing more straight than you were when your pinky was forward, right? Like so. So this is if you want to hit somebody in the face. And those are the three positions. So let's switch between. Start with the carry. Carry position. Go underarm. And thrust and back. Go low and thrust and back. Tuck underarm and thrust and back. Go high and thrust and back and return to underarm. So your underarm is kind of your neutral here and you can lower, you can higher. But your hand never moves. You don't have to toss anything. You don't have to stick anything in the ground. There's no twirling. It's just an efficient stabby, 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 stab, while your other arm maintains the shield wall. Make sense? All right. So we're going to try these both in a shield wall on the battlefield. There's one more thing we need to talk about before we do that, though. And these are phalanx terms. There are two parts of the phalanx structure, the rank and the file. And that's on the diagram here. So the rank is the row across. 
And the file is the person in front of you. Like a single file line is when you've got like one person two, lined up. And this is important because your ranks and your files have to remain standardized. So part of what we'll do when we're in the field is we'll count off probably by threes, form three ranks, and then just make sure everybody's behind somebody else. And that's important because if you're staggered, you might end up accidentally bonking somebody in the face behind you. So it's important to be aware who's behind you, who's in front of you. Another thing we'll play with a little bit is stance. So there's some argument over whether you stand with your shield exactly in front of you with your feet like this, square on, that's a little silly, as these folks are demonstrating. Or do you stand all the way sideways? We see this in vases a lot, probably because it looks cool. Uh, more likely, though, we're going to take kind of a three-quarter stance, like so, which makes sense due to physics. Okay. So here are the rules, the rules of hoplite day. Don't poke your spear into anyone. Please, please don't stab anybody. Um, at a certain point, we'll break up into teams and we'll have uh, some balls coming at us, so we'll have something to dodge behind. Uh, if you, and not your shield, if your shield gets hit with the ball, it's awesome, your shield's doing its job. If you get hit with the ball, then you are dead, so play dead safely. If somebody next to you is dead, don't step on them. Common sense, uh, but... These rules exist for a reason. <laughs> so, yeah, don't be like that guy. Okay, let's see. So if, if your shield is hit and it breaks, if it falls off, if something goes horribly wrong, then uh, yeah, your, your shield's gone, you're out of the fight, you're dead. So when you're dead, just kind of like see yourself off the battlefield. Uh, go hang out in the Elysian fields until our next round. Let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, so we are going to have some people playing the Persians at some point. We're going to do a little Thermopylae action. Please don't stab the Persians, especially the volunteer Persians. A few volunteers from Finn's history class are going to be here. I know this is weird to say in a warfare context, but be nice to the enemy. Don't, don't hurt anyone. Um, and if you need to take a break at any time, you absolutely can. This is entirely voluntary. Uh, if, if you're not feeling well, step off. If you're not into it, step off. If balls are coming at your face and it's just eh, fine. I'm not keeping track of who is and is not doing what at any given time. It's just this is for you, not done to you. So as long as this is a useful experience that helps you get in touch with how a spear and shield work in this context, great, it's doing its job. You're going to have what you need to write your paper at the end of this, which is the goal. But when you're done, you're done, and that, that's fine too. And then finally, just don't be a jerk. I, I can't define jerkiness for all situations, but uh, be your best self. Fight with honor, uh, by which I mean don't actually fight anyone uh, as much as you can. But yeah, a couple of things to keep in mind. You know, this uh, this is very far removed from the reality of ancient warfare for obvious reasons. Like if I made you actually go to battle with someone, I don't think I'd have a job for very long. But this doesn't mean we can't use it to get inside the emotional landscape of a hoplite battle as well as the mechanics of how spears work. So think about what it's like being in a phalanx, what it's like having to pay attention to when other people are stabbing and maintain a line and march in order with each other. Think about how somebody else's shield is affecting your shield. You know, how does that make you feel about that other person? I mean, try not to take it out on them, but you know, pay attention to these things because these are all things that you can talk about in your paper which is a little open-ended. Basically, the paper is asking you to read Sage again, read his version of how hoplite combat works, 
and then use your experience today to interrogate it a little bit. What looks right? What doesn't look right? What is he leaving out? Um, what did you learn? It's a pretty free form. The assignment is up on the assignments page of Blackboard. I've recorded this lecture so you can have it for later if you need it. And that's about it. So without any further ado, oh yes, question? I cannot remember off the top of my head. Uh, it's however many words I said it is. I, th I think it's 600-ish. It's not that long. Yeah. Alrighty, any other questions? Yes. Eventually. Um, probably in about two weeks. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, for the, the recording, um, Samantha's asking whether javelins are equivalent to archery and to a certain extent, but they form a mid-range. So archery can go farther and hits harder in some ways than javelins, but archery has to maintain a long range to work. So this allows you to have three waves if you have archers. The archery wave, the javelin wave, and then you hit with your heavy infantry. There you go, yeah, short, medium, long, tall, venti, grande, whatever the, yeah, <laughs> the degrees. Okay, without any further ado then, let's pack up Put on your cold weather gear and let's get to this.